watching. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community. For the community. By the community. And it's a wrap. Shalom, Boston. All this for little Israel, huh? I'm overwhelmed. I'm humbled. You make me so proud. And you need to be proud of yourselves as well. To stand by us through such a trying time for so long. To support not only the state of Israel, but your families in Israel. And yes, I can see that sign up there. Proud of our IDF son. Parakamon! And welcome to Shalom Hartford. Today I'm speaking to Yehuda Yaakov. He was born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens, and graduated Syracuse University with a BA in Journalism and International Relations. Today he is the Israeli Consul General to New England. He's also switched his loyalty from the New York Yankees to the Boston Red Sox. How does that happen? I'm Pat Kazakov. You're watching Shalom Hartford. Stay with me and we're going to meet Yehuda Yaakov. So you graduated in 1982, Syracuse. Right. Okay. Yeah. Shalom Hartford, first of all. Shalom Hartford. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Better way to start. Shalom Hartford. You graduated in 1982, and then in 1983, you moved to Israel. That's right. I moved to Israel. Why? Frankly, I was actually a victim of student loan burden, and I decided that I was going to, as quickly as possible, pay back those debts. I worked two full-time jobs, and when I finished with that, it took me about... A year and a half, I was exhausted. And like any other young person, you know, what do you do when you're exhausted? You go abroad, right? Israel was cheaper. The kibbutz just didn't cost anything. And I went to Israel. Why did you choose Israel? I'd been to, first of all, I'd been to Israel a number of times. I grew up in a, a very strong Zionist home with a, with a, a very robust um, traditional Jewish core. Um, so obviously it was a natural. I also had relatives in Israel uh, who actually came to Israel from India. So it's... Uh, uh, totally different story. You're Indian Jew. From India, yep. Both parents? My father. You said that you had came from a robust Zionist background. Did you mm -hmm. come from a religious background? No, not at all. Because of my father's uh, influence, uh, a very traditional Sephardic home. The holiday, Shabbat, the basic symbols of, uh, of, Judaism. Our, of Judaism were definitely uh, observed in, in the home. Plus, of course, you have the euphoria, the post-1967 euphoria, which, like many people's homes, swept through mine as well. I guess it kind of forged an identity that, that's you know, really been basic to me. Most people went to Israel, like you said, they want to go abroad. That's not a problem. But what they do is they flirt with the yeshiva, swimming in Elat. They flirt with a kibbutz. But you went into the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, yes. Uh, but that was a, it was a very impulsive move, I have to say. Um, as I said, I had actually no intention of living in Israel and, and really you know, um, setting up my life there. That wasn't the original thought. Um, but one thing kind of led to another, and young people tend to do things, don't always think about things to their logical conclusions. So it wasn't a planful move? No, not at all. I was like rolling from thing to thing, uh, really. And my Hebrew was abysmal, but I went, I, you know, I was drafted in the army anyway after uh, making a decision. Um, but um, So it wasn't a great sort of intellectual thought <sighs> that they wanted to save Israel and be part of the IDF. There, there wasn't... No, there really wasn't. As, as said, uh, uh, Zion is very dedicated to the state of Israel and the Jewish people. But no, no. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a story. When I arrived at the kibbutz... You know, what they kibbutz give, did you go It to? was Kibbutz Alonim in Alonim. the Jezreel Valley, which I'm very fond of uh, to this day. And they give you jobs. And the job they wanted to give me was to work in the fields. And I asked them, uh, what time do you have to get up in the morning? And it was like 3 o'clock. I said, that's absurd. Even though I did want to get my hands dirty, you know, in the soil of our forefathers and but, all that. But not that dirty. Not that dirty or not <laughs> that early. Um, so in the end, I got something which was much later in the kitchen washing dishes. So that was the level of my ideological commitment to this thing. So when did the ideological commitment start? Um, well, I was ideologically committed. Certainly when I joined the IDF, that was, that was clear. I mean, you don't join the army if you're not committed uh, to it, but I had, um, we had a formative moment as I was coming to the end of my service. Uh, I remember it vividly to this day. We were, uh, a friend, in a, uh, myself and, and an Anglo friend of mine, who had also, we were serving in the same unit in the Golani Brigade in infantry. Isn't yeah. that like a, a high-level brigade? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah I guess it is, yeah. <laughs> it's a long time ago. It's um, an elite brigade. Today, it was more, more, it, today it's more so elite brigade than it was back then. Back then it was just the grunts. Are you being modest or is that the I'll truth? leave that to you. <laughs> Anyway, we're sitting in Dizengoff Center, a friend and I, it was a Saturday night, and I sent him to get some ice cream, and he comes back with that ice cream, and I said, you know, uh, what's, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. He says, I can't deal with these rowdy Israeli teenagers. And he couldn't get, he couldn't get through them to get the ice cream. And he said, you see what's happened here? We've given, you know, a, a year and a half or whatever of our, of our lives uh, to a country that we think we love, but we know nothing about. Um, and I think that maybe that's where the the uh, substantive part of the island she kicked into me and I said we have to we have to see where we are who we're living amongst and give this a chance um, he took actually a different road he actually left the country and did other things for a very very long time and I ran into him maybe 10 years ago in the streets of Jerusalem still living in Jerusalem he had just come back <laughs> to Jerusalem after wandering around for a very long time whereas I had already you know established my life Right. So now you're in Israel, you're with the IDF, and you're sort of thinking about, uh, like you're thinking a little bit more ideologically. When I'm in the IDF, I'm thinking about how long does this, how long how does, does this last? <laughs> how long, do, and then when, and when it ends, what do you do? Um, I go to university, actually. You probably know this, the, um, the Ministry of Absorption makes it fairly easy for new immigrants to continue their education, and so I, um, I went to Hebrew University to uh, continue my education. Were you a big academic? Uh, back then, no. No? <laughs> no. I wouldn't consider myself an amazing academic achiever. I'm uh, definitely not, and that's, of course, to your viewers, there should be some encouragement, particularly <laughs> the young people. Well, that's, the, that's, why, <laughs> that's why I'm asking, because the history doesn't speak, your history isn't speaking to great ideology or at great morality. No, it's speaking, very, much, very much a regular person. You're a regular person. Absolutely. Right. So, okay, so we're, so we're now, have we joined the, minister, the Ministry of, um, of Foreign Affairs yet or not yet? No, I did, still I did a year in uh, university. Basically, to, to, to get my bearings, to meet people, make friends. I met my wife, Ofra. A lot of my, my social core it remains from that time. As a matter of fact, I got to know Israel much better, um, obviously, than I had known it before. Um, and then uh, we come to the next formative moment in, my, in this journey. Did you love it as you were doing this? Like, as you were in university, of course, you meet your wife there. Yeah. So it has all... Well, I love my wife. Yes, I'm say, sure you We're married love 30 years already, so... Right, I'm sure you love your wife. Uh, did yes. You, did you love... Like, did you have that feeling? Yeah, that, that definitely starts to develop then. Absolutely. We get married, move into a uh, suburb of Jerusalem. How old were you when you got married? Um, I would have been 26, and I have a young daughter, and I'm already working three years in the government press office which is kind of an adjunct of the prime minister's office. And uh, I kind of realized that there's no, there's no really possibilities beyond what I've done. I was, the, I was the government correspondent for the first intifada. I covered the Demanu trial. It's like a really weird job with a lot of, you know, it really expands my horizons. So I, doing that job, I had this kind of seminal moment. I was, um, one of the great things we got to do was to accompany, uh, the pres president was Herzog and the prime minister was Shamir. And they, had, they both had a custom of once a week going to meet the people. And I remember I was with Prime Minister Shamir. We were at a dedication of some university. And it was pouring rain, I remember. And I was with the, his entourage. And then there was a separate media entourage. And like they didn't have an umbrellas and they were trudging in the mud. And it's I was unpleasant. looking at them and I'm saying, I don't want to do this. Is this really what I want to do? Right. Is this what I want to do when I'm like 40? Right. Is this going to be my contribution to Israel? And at that point, I decided I'm going to have to do something else. And around the same time, I'm talking to my wife, Ofra, and I said, look, I've done everything I can do in this job. I've got to move on. And my wife, certainly at the time, preferred job security and said, stay where you are. <laughs> right. I disagreed. And then we, I ran into an ad in the paper uh, for the cadets course of the Israeli Foreign Ministry. And I asked her, what do you think? And she says to me, you don't have a chance. Mm -hmm. Your Hebrew sucks. I'm a wife. Okay. So I can tell you that. A wife is going to tell you the truth. Okay. So You're, she was right. She My was Hebrew right. Was not she, good. Must have, she must have she been right. She said to me, your knowledge of Judaism is eh, and on the Middle East you don't have a clue. And I said, okay, so we have a bet. And at the same time I got called up to reserve duty to the Gaza Strip. Uh, so that was a problem because if I had all these shortages in my knowledge base, I had to, you know, close them. You had them. to beef it, beef it Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Yeah. So I uh, basically took a duffel bag, filled it up with books. Um, and I go to the Gaza Strip. 
And I go to my commander, I said, you know, of course, I'm a patriot. I'm, this is very important. I'm glad to be here. And he looks at me, he gives me this look like he's going <laughs> to slap me one, you know, the next moment. <laughs> what do you want? I said, look, I got to study. Just give me any job that takes as little time as possible. And he gave me the most dangerous job. Which uh, was? It was patrolling um, the refugee camp. I was the, kind of the head of the patrol. Uh, and it was dangerous. It was the first intifada, but it was dangerous, even at that time. So thank God we got through it. It, um, it only took an hour and a half in the, middle, in, the middle, in the beginning of the day and an hour and a half toward the end of the day. So I had lots of time to study. And, and that's what you did. And the rest is history, kind of, you know. And you got in. I got through. It's actually three or four stages, but yeah, I got through it. You said you traveled with the prime minister's entourage? Throughout the country. Throughout the country. Yeah. I mean, that's a heady thing to do. I mean, you're In the helicopters. Right. It's heady. I mean, now that you look back, you realize that it's a heady thing. Yeah. You, you had called uh, Shimon Perez Mr. Security. Yes. You, you were very, very moved by mm -hmm. Shimon Perez. So you've had a lot of prime ministers that you've gone through since Shamir. Do you have nicknames for the other prime ministers? Uh, what you, would you call You got Shamir? me there. I what would you call Shamir off the top of your head? Well, that's interesting. I th I, 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 first of all, I have to say all the, the prime ministers that I you know, had you know, interacted with in some way, I don't want to make myself to be more than I actually am, but I, I have had the opportunity. Um, they all have some, they've all had that uh, special unique quality, right. you know, which is unique to them, obviously. I saw Shimon Perez. I couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. I thought that this was like a, a, a person from, from outer space. Did I put some characteristics on him because he was Shimon Perez, uh -huh. or was he this very special person? Well, it's, it's probably a combination. I think with Shimon, uh, uh, Yitzhak Shamir, it would be a combination probably what I remember is of um, Mr. S stability Mr. and Mr. Skepticism. Okay. I think I, what about Netanyahu? What's your... Uh... Well, I think the, uh, the Prime Minister has, has said himself he wants to be remembered as the guardian of Israel's security. So uh, far be it for me to actually give him a nickname. I will, I will just kind of as an addendum say, I think the prime minister has showed uh, tremendous vision, particularly when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, and, you know, people tend to be skeptical of governments, thinking that only civil society can get anything done or whatever. But a number of years ago, the prime minister, you know, stood up and said, I'm going to make Israel um, an international hub for cybersecurity cooperation. And he did that. In, in, in a number of ways, so um, he needs, deserves a lot of credit for that. Mr. Cybersecurity, would that be reasonable? Uh, well, again, the Guardian of Israel Security is how <laughs> okay, he defines we're, himself. So We're going to go with Guardian of okay. Israel. Okay. We're ta we just talked about cybersecurity. You have a lot of experience in cybersecurity and uh, also in unconventional weapons. You were the head of, of a unit about unconventional right. weapons. What are well, the prevention of the spread of, I should say. The prevention of the spread <laughs> of unconventional weapons. What are unconventional weapons? Nuclear weapons, chemical, biological, I guess. Uh, even though the world is changing, that would be the traditional core. But I have to say, I am not a traditional diplomat. Um, my career kind of um, or fate brought me uh, into a position where I have probably two-thirds of my career has been in what we call political, military, or strategic affairs. Um, whether it's um, as a diplomat, you know, um, constantly um, involved in how can diplomacy make a more robust contribution to Israel's security, whether it's uh, counterterrorism, the prevention of non-conventional weapons, um, the cyber piece, um, Iran clearly is something that's engulfed me uh, for quite a while. And um, you will find people like me, a very small core of people like me, not only in the Israeli Foreign Service, but in other, um, in other uh, foreign services of Western countries particularly. So you had all that experience in, in cybersecurity and in strategic experience yeah. also. And then you worked for, in New Zealand, which is not exactly a hotbed of terrorism. That was my first uh, diplomatic post abroad. Uh, that was where I cut my teeth on diplomacy. Um, it's a necessary experience, and it was a good place to start. How many years were you in New Zealand? Uh, three years. And then also you were in New York. You were at the Consul of D Media. Two different, very, two very <laughs> different jobs. In, in New Zealand, I was just starting out. Uh, and in New York, I was uh, basically the spokesperson, also responsible for our um, uh, public affairs uh, activities at the height of the Second Intifada. So that was, that oh. was a very, very, very hot time to be, uh, to be in that seat. Um, so how does this kind of experience 
prepare you to be the Consul General of New, to New England? The first thing you, you, you learn as you're kind of going up the ladder as a diplomat is that the path to success is by creating partnerships. That would be the first thing. You have to be able to create partnerships on, which are based on common, kind of common denominator. Uh, you have to be able to listen. It's really important to listen, and Israelis don't always excel in listening. I'm the first to admit. And once you listen to people, um, you hear what, not only their concerns, but what drives them. You know, it makes all the difference. So I what are you doing um, as Consul General in New England? Well, What's obviously... What's the job? Well, in 10 words or less, like they taught me at Syracuse University, Newhouse School, it is to um, enhance positive identification with Israel. That's what, I'm, that's what I... That's the big mission. That's the big mission. This is what I'm here for. Different components speak to people in different ways. You need to be, as I said, attentive to that and then try to drive that uh, to them. So, look, I don't come from a business background. I don't come from an academic background, per se. But these are two very, very weighty pieces in New England. And this has is, this is essentially been the focus. And, um, uh, I mean, if I just take the economic piece, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the new kid in the block in, in Connecticut, but... Uh, well, Connecticut, ju you just got Connecticut. Last year. In 2016. Yeah, right from... Be before it was part of the New York office. Absolutely. Why the change? Well, formerly because we closed Philadelphia and headquarters had to re-divvy the territory. It was very much a logistic thing. Right, it's logistic and... But I have to tell you, since my first day in Boston, I kept saying, you got to give us Connecticut. Connecticut, even though... Apropos your comment about the Red Sox, it is divided, you know, between Red Sox and Yankees, and I, my advice is just give peace a chance mm -hmm. on that one. You can get along, and you've proved it, but it's part of Connecticut. It's part of New England, and it, I, think, I think it belonging to, to our consulate, it's more conducive to, to just getting work done. But, um, so what are you doing with the economic So on, on the economic side, How does I think, that look? Well, the first, um, uh, not being an economic person, and aware that when you're representing Israel, you can, be, is busy, you can keep yourself busy 24-7. It's not a problem. So you have to be really focused. And when I came and I said, look, we have all the pieces of cybersecurity ecosystem on the Israeli side, on the New England side. What we need to do is to create a relationship between them, a really robust, intimate relationship between them. And, and then those components, some were more obvious. The technological business side was much more active. And it's really no-brainer. Um, you know, uh, out of deference to Connecticut, um, there are some pretty big Massachusetts companies which have a very big footprint in Israel. And I'm talking about EMC, Akamai, Raytheon, just to mention three. But some of the other pieces weren't really so active. Uh, government, government to government. Oh, well, you, I, I noticed that Charlie Baker, uh, Governor Charlie Baker, uh, he traveled to Israel, and I noticed that after he went, there's like all sorts of alliances that you, you made with the health business and right. with, the, with the technology business. So right, uh, so you hit, the, you hit the nail on the head. That visit was kind of taking what I just mentioned to the next level. So you have the cyber activity, but the governor goes with a very large delegation of, I don't know, there were about 80 people on that delegation. And I had already been with his predecessor, Deval Patrick, who focused on life sciences much more. Governor Baker put the focus on cybersecurity in this mission together with digital health. And coming back, I think five or six Israeli founded companies already announced or already set up shop in greater Boston. That is the kind of thing so that I like to see in Connecticut. So that's the measurement. Yes. That's the measurement. Oh, that's absolutely. how you measure your success. Absolutely. And since then there have been conferences and more guests from Israel have come and more companies are going to Israel. And it starts to become, I don't want to exaggerate the point, but it starts to operate on automatic pilot. It's on ecosystem. Yeah. It becomes an ecosystem. Absolutely. Something comes and something right. goes. And the academic piece also, um, President of MIT went to Israel uh, at the beginning of this yeah, year. Yeah, what is this tech? You have a, a program called Tech Tracks. Ah, very good. Tech Tracks. <laughs> yes, Tech so, Tracks. So Tech Tracks is a great invention by uh, one of my own staffers. She basically said, look, we've got all these pieces going on. Why don't we bring the students into it? And her idea was that we would, on a periodical basis, bring students who are interested in technology, in entrepreneurship and innovation, but for whatever reason are still not ready or don't have the finances or the opportunity to go to Israel and see all this firsthand, we'll take them to the Israeli-founded companies based in New England. And that's what we've been doing. We've and that been, works? Oh, it's a, these are, this is a very popular program. Now that we are involved in Connecticut, we intend to also bring Connecticut universities 
uh, into this, and they spend a full day. They visit two or three Israeli companies. Uh, who, plus funds, who funds that? We do. When you say we, does that mean Israel? The consulate. The consulate funds that. Yeah. yeah. As far as I know, Can I we... Can come? As far as, oh, yeah, <laughs> come and visit. Why not? Next trip, we'll let you know. <laughs> okay. What's happening in Connecticut in business? Like you, you, talk, you talked a lot about right. um, the businesses that were set up in Boston. Now, you've only been in Connecticut for one year. That's right. Have you met with our governor, Daniel Malloy? I have met with the governor. I've met with the lieutenant governor. I've met with, uh, obviously, the political leadership. And I'm starting to get to know the other influentials in the state who are minded or dedicated to creating a more robust uh, economic relationship. I think that the universities are very much a part of this. So I find myself spending increasing number of uh, visits in Yale. Uh, and Yale is not the only university. I'm here, UConn and, uh, and others here. But I have to admit, I am the new kid on the block. Mm -hmm. And um, listening uh, much more than telling. The, the main message I'm putting forward is this. First of all, I've, I've learned that there are an increasing number of Israeli companies who are um, um, setting up uh, an external headquarters here in, in Connecticut. My challenge is this. Uh, we need to ask ourselves whether or not this is happening kind of on a sporadic piecemeal basis, or are we working on a strategic intentional mode? Well, I'm hearing a strategic, a strategic intentional mode. That's what I'm hearing from well, you. Well, that's my goal. But I have to create the partnerships and the collaborations so that we get all the right people together and start working uh, toward that goal. Because, I mean, Connecticut is a powerful state. It's an influential state. Um, with all the components necessary to create a really strong business relationship for mutual benefit. One of your goals is to make Israel part of the Middle East. It's not making, it's, um, it's essentially, my, my contention is this. I claim that Israel has already integrated into the Middle East, that its relationships with not all its neighbors, we have enemies, unfortunately, and those enemies will continue to exist, but the critical mass of our neighborhood not only accepts Israel, but views Israel as part of the solution, not the problem. That's a huge sea change if you, if you think that 40 years ago in November, Anwar Sadat visited Israel. And he was alone. And he received no support. Of all the events that we are celebrating this year, we need to really celebrate this event because that was a pioneer act, which has led today to amazing things. I'll just give you two examples if I can. The king of Bahrain in the last couple of weeks has been quoted as saying that he's sick of the Arab boycott and would love for his subjects to visit Israel. And the other one is during the lead up to the Kurdish, Kurdish referendum in Iraq, Israeli flags were being flown. That boggles the mind. I want to ask you, is Iran helping this? I mean, in another way, because everyone is, everyone is afra afraid, afraid of Iran. Is that making the Arab, other, other Arab states and Israel join together? They have a common enemy? Different takes on that. My take is that it's definitely a part of it but it's only a part of it, that there are other processes in play here, an evolutionary acceptance of Israel, a recognition that the Middle East suffers from a water shortage. Where is it going to get it from? Israel is today, with all the desalination plants that we have, we're a water superpower. You have a, you have a, you have a, uh, a, a, a partnership with Palestine and the water. With the Palestinians, with the, with the Jordanians. Uh, gas. Uh, we now... Only up to a few years ago, we were getting gas from Egypt. We will soon be exporting gas to Egypt. Same for, we have a 15-year uh, contract with uh, Jordan to supply them with gas. Palestinians will obviously enjoy that. And other countries, including in the Gulf, whose gas reserves are increasingly depleted, will have to get their gas from somewhere. It could be Israel. Um, and beyond that, um, look, in the last few years, uh, Middle East has, seen, uh, has, has undergone a very volatile period. The Arab Spring morphed into the Arab winter. Um, Syria imploded. And through all this, Israel continues to project stability and infect the other countries with that stability. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing a very positive message. One last question before we go. Sure. If you were to advise young people who wanted to be in the diplomatic corps, what would you tell them to do? I would tell them that they need, if they want to um, to follow kind of a, a fascinating career that I've been able, they're gonna to have to be proactive. They're going to have to seize the opportunities and create opportunities for themselves. Otherwise, diplomacy can be a very, very mundane profession. 
So they're gonna have to be very proactive, they have to seize and create opportunities, and then it could be really a fun place to be. Yeah, you look like you're having fun. I am. We've been talking to Yehuda Yaakov, and he is the Consul General, the Israeli Consul General to New England, and things seem to be very, very positive. His last word of advice, if you want to be a diplomat, if you want to work in the foreign ministry, you got to carpe diem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, we have disrupted their death tunnels. We have depleted their rocket arsenal. We have made it clear to them that Israel will defend its Muslim, Christian, and Jewish civilians under attack. And we have maintained our moral code.